we'll uh, work a little bit on that slide presentation. We're working on how God went through a lot of work to establish the authority of the scripture here. And uh, so <clears throat> I take, I'd taken some time to develop what God did um, to establish Moses' authority. Okay, I mean, you know, and when Moses was 40, according to Stephen in Acts chapter 7, you know, he, you know, he, it entered his mind, the scripture says, to go down and visit his brethren, the sons of Israel, okay? And he saw an Egyptian slave driver beating a fellow Hebrew. See, it's interesting to me that in Exodus they're already calling them Hebrews. <clears throat> and uh, so he killed the slave driver, hid the body in the sand, didn't think anybody saw it, right? <clears throat> so then he goes down the next day, and a couple of the, the Hebrew brethren are fighting. Moses steps in the middle and says, why are you guys fighting each other? You're brethren. And uh, the guy that was winning the, the fight said, hey, wait a minute, who are you? You know, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? You don't intend to kill me like you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? See, Moses got no credibility at that point. So he's gone 40 years. See, so God's going to have to do a lot of work to establish Moses' credibility, and he did, okay? <clears throat> By the time they're done with all the plagues on the land of Egypt, see, Moses is highly respected <clears throat> by not only Israel, but he's highly respected by, by the Egyptians as well. And so uh, when uh, the children of Israel saw the carcasses of the Egyptians floating on the Red Sea, the scripture says they believed <clears throat> in, the, in the Lord and in his servant Moses. See, in other words, God established Moses' credibility. <clears throat> in the process, of course, <clears throat> Moses is writing, you know, uh, essentially Genesis through Deuteronomy, plus, in my opinion, Job, and at least one psalm, okay? And uh, the way he puts it here, came about when Moses finished writing the words of this law in a book until they were complete, that Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and place it beside the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may remain there as a witness against you. So <clears throat> Moses then had recorded those things, and by this point, see, what Moses writes down is regarded by Israel, and rightly so, as coming from God. See, Moses' credibility is established, and the point is that the scriptures that Moses wrote are established as credible. Because that's, that's the, the thrust of this whole slide presentation is to show how God established, for anybody objective, the, the credibility of the scriptures. Any, any questions or thoughts or comments on this so far? Okay. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, I, I think this is a, I'm glad you're doing this because for us in our time, we can look back and we can see the full complete plan and all that but as you're going through it how are these guys figuring it out I'm really thankful you're putting you put the work into it because it's it's a I think it's a nagging thought in a lot of people's minds but isn't often pursued as an answer so just I I guess thank you amen <laughs> yeah well I have a lot of nagging thoughts <laughs> some of them from inside some from outside uh, but, uh, see, again, that's a great point, see, that we're looking at the Scripture, we're looking backwards. See, and God's got to establish the authority of his written word in order for him to be able to execute his plan uh, long term. And so it's a, it's a key point that not only did he write it, but that he's establishing its authority for a significant number of people so that that there's carry through. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> so Moses, of course, is going to die. So God's got to establish the, the authority of Joshua next. Okay, so <clears throat> God told Moses, He said, "You're going to put some of your authority on him." Okay, well, <clears throat> obviously the word of God stands firm. <clears throat> the, uh, this is this is a weird setup here, so. I need a bigger marker board for it. <coughs> the other one, the other one didn't survive family camp. 
Okay, somebody's head went through it. <coughs> okay, so he says, you'll put some of your authority on him in order that the son, all the son, a congregation, the sons of Israel may obey him. See, now, just like in Moses' case, they, you know, let's see here, that's probably in your way here. Okay, so in Moses' case, you know, when Moses gives orders for Israel to leave Egypt, they got to go. Okay, you can't have, you know, you can't have 2,000 families saying, well, we're going to stick around one more day. Okay. No, they all got to go. See, so same way when, <clears throat> when Joseph, uh, J- Joshua says we got to go, then Israel's got to go with them. See, so God's got to establish Joshua's authority as well. Next uh, line. So Ma- Moses laid his hands on Joshua and commissioned him. Um, I think I got my Bible here somewhere. Let's uh, turn to Numbers 27 there. So in Numbers 27, 20, <clears throat> says, you shall put some of your authority on him, okay? And so in verse 23, <clears throat> then Moses laid his hands on him and commissioned him just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. Of course, this is done very publicly <clears throat> in the sight of all Israel. Remember, all Israel is together. You know, they're not scattered throughout the land or anything. They're all together. <clears throat> they haven't crossed the, the Jordan yet. They're on the east side of the Jordan and uh, they haven't crossed yet. So they're all together. This is done very publicly. Next line. So <clears throat> in verse uh, Deuteronomy 31, Deuteronomy 31:23. Again, in the sight of Israel, all Israel, then he commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun, and he said, Be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the sons of Israel into the land which I swore to them, and I will be with you. Okay, next line. So Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him, and the sons of Israel listened to him as uh, did the... As the <laughs> I wonder who typed that thing. Deuteronomy 34.9, my secretary. The sons of Israel listened to him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. Okay, that, that reads correctly. It's just the guy with eyesight up here has got, you know. <laughs> the, uh, it is interesting since, uh, you know, I had my eyelid operation. They told me my prescription would change. Now it has. See, I, I can't see the clock back there. Well, I can see the hands on it, but <laughs> so, so next next step. But you know, that's the, I'm glad I got it done. But anyhow, yes, the, the eyesight is a bit of a problem this morning. Okay. So anyhow, my point is, is the authority of Joshua is established all, in all Israel, and what's Joshua going to do? Okay. Next slide. <laughs> So Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, next line, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, O moon, in the valley of Ajalon. Mo, uh, Joshua said, all right, <clears throat> sun and moon, stop. Okay, if you're watching this, and it stops. That's pretty impressive, right? Now, every once in a while, you'll read some. There's something circulating through. It's called the missing day of Joshua. You know, that says that they've gone back with computers. That's bogus. Okay, because you can't see if everything stops. Okay, that's not going to show up. Okay, there's, you can't. You know, the, if if it's the planetarium stop for a day then that's not going to show up on the record. You can't go back there and find the missing day of Joshua. So you can't always believe all this stuff. You can't believe everything you read even before there was the Internet. Okay? <laughs> but he's, he commanded the sun to stand still. Next line. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves their enemies 
Is it not written in the book of Jashar? And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky, did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. There was no day like that before it or after it when the Lord listened to the voice of man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Okay? Now, <clears throat> again, how's, how's Joshua's authority stacking up here? Pretty good. And, uh, you know, so uh, you could probably, if you went on the internet, you could probably find the book of Jashar. Uh, it's probably published in Salt Lake City. <laughs> those guys, those guys make stuff up, you know, and pretend like, uh, you know. So again, you, you can't believe everything that's in print. All right, you gotta check it out. So next slide. So we're getting ready to establish the authority of Samuel. See, but God's already got, see, Joshua established. Okay, so. When, when the book of Joshua is written, now that's accepted, isn't it? Okay? Then God starts his work with the judges. Right? Now, the last judge <clears throat> and the first that held the office of prophet, there were prophets, but to hold the office of prophet was Samuel. The Lord came and he stood and called at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Now, that's a good, good lesson for us, right? <clears throat> speak, Lord. Of course, he's going to speak through the scripture, right? Your servant is listening, uh, and we'll add moving, okay? <laughs> yeah. so, <clears throat> so the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do the thi a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. Okay, remember, <clears throat> Eli was slack. I mean, th this guy was a total disgrace as a high priest. Um, in Israel, you know, and a lot of immorality going on at the tabernacle with his sons and, you know, the, the ladies that served at the, the tabernacle. I mean, great. Uh, you know, the, they weren't following the instructions given through Moses on, you know, the type of meat that the priests could eat. And, you know, they just took, did what they wanted. Just, and uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so Samuel, as a very, very young boy, has this prophecy delivered to him. Now remember, Samuel's story is that uh, his, his mother you know, prayed for a son. And she said, God, if you give me a son, then I'll dedicate him to the Lord all the days of his life. Now, um, Samuel's dad was a Levite. Okay? Now, Samuel's dad was not a priest. Samuel's dad was a Levite. And so he, he, you know, and they fall. Actually, let's go to the book of 1 Samuel here. This is interesting. Scripture is very, very careful, you know, consistent here. And uh, it says in verse 1, 1 Samuel 1 1, now there was a certain man from Ramathaim Zophim in the hill country of Ephraim. His name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. Okay, now, when you're reading that, you think, well, maybe he's from Ephraim. But actually, remember, the Levites were scattered, and so he's a Levite in Ephraim, okay? And uh, verse 3, it says, this man would go up from his city yearly to worship, see, and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Okay, so in other words, he's bringing his sacrifices. He can't, he can't offer the sacrifices. He's a priest. But he is coming to worship. See, that's consistent with what we know about Israel. They, they worshiped at the tabernacle. The people worshiped, and the priests served. Okay, Or if the Levites were in the process of setting up the tabernacle or taking down the tabernacle, that was called service as well. Okay, it was service of the Lord. So the scripture was, was consistent on that. So... <clears throat> eventually uh, Samuel's born, brings him down to the high priest, and uh, <clears throat> so Samuel takes up residence in the Holy of Holiness. <laughs> I mean, Eli was slack. He, he was sleeping out in the front room, out in the, in the holy place. And, uh, you know, Samuel's job was to <clears throat> put the lights out at night and, you know, to get the lamps lit in the morning. Those lamps were supposed to be perpetual, but hey, it's hard for Eli to sleep in there with that light on, so we got we got to snuff the lights. This just shows you. But so the Lord spoke through Samuel, okay, and 
and the house of Eli is going to come to an end. And uh, that happens in the days, uh, ending of the days of David and the beginning of Solomon, where the lion's going to switch over to Zadok. Zadok is one of the, <clears throat> the lions of high priests, but uh, it's, uh, you know, the direct descendant of Eli is going to end, and it's going to switch to Zadok. And so by the time you get to the New Testament, the, the priest, or Zadoks, or Zadoxes, which we bring into English as Sadducees. See, that's, that gives you an idea how, how much follow-through there is on that. Um, so, next line. <clears throat> so, thus Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and literally let none of his words fall to the ground. Kind of interesting. That's, that's a great picture. None of his words fell. Everything was fulfilled. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. Okay? So, when Samuel writes the book of Judges, authoritative, right? When 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel gets written, it's going to be regarded as authoritative. Thoughts or comments on this? Yeah. Jason? Every child needs a governess. <laughs> and we've got a red light on this, Bob. Thanks. Um, just stands out in my mind that, okay, while, while God's backing Samuel, Samuel had a responsibility to make sure he was right mm -hmm. before he went ahead. So mm -hmm. um, just the quality of Samuel's character must have been pretty um, mm -hmm. outstanding for him to be able to, uh, you know, make the right call, execute the right call, yep. and be able to see what needed to be done. Yeah. Um, you know, the uh, God's desire to use people is, you know, in a positive way, is going to be character based. You know, okay, uh, Samuel's two sons, <coughs> Israel did not want those two boys to be judges. Why? They're crooks. <laughs> they took bribes and everything, all right? Crooked judges, okay? See, there's no, never anything against Samuel. And uh, so when it comes to the new covenant, see, God's going to use people who have the, the character qualities, you know, as, as Josiah was pointing out, in the process of developing the character qualities um, that he wants us to be effective. See, some, you know, when it says in Matthew 11, 11, that uh, the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Immerser. See, the, the guys that oppose the concept of new creation try to argue there that uh, God could have used anybody. Well, John was used by God because he was the character that, uh, you know, he's an honorable, upright character. And the idea then that we as Christians are going to exceed that because of the fact that we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. See, so they try to disconnect connect character from performance, uh, but God, God never does. Okay, good, good comment. Other, other thoughts here? Yeah, we're green. Can you expound on, I guess, that there? Because I would say the same thing. God could have used anyone. I mean, we know that from Esther. If this is not your time, you know. And if you don't do it, God will raise somebody else up. So, yes, God could have used anybody. There was a plan there. But, I mean, what is their end goal? Yeah. Well, see, again, that's a great question. The, the record of Scripture is all the people are commended by God are people of faith. Okay? So I think it was brought up last week about Rahab, the harlot, you know, on the wall. Why would God use her? Well, okay, maybe that was her past. Okay, but she was a lady of faith. What do you think the, the faith that she had did to her character? See, it transformed her character. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so God's record is that he uses in a positive way those who develop the types of character that he wants <clears throat> best they could at the time. We recognize that there are caps <clears throat> on the Old Testament people. 
you know, in, in John chapter 1, see verses 12 and 13. John 1, 12, it says, as many as received him, that is, you know, the, the people of Jewish background during the time of Jesus' earthly sojourn, okay, is the context here. Uh, the many has recognized that he was the Messiah, in other words. To them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So the point is, is that those who become Christians then, are born of God, okay, with the new, the new potential. Um, the, because, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things combined, a new picture, a uh, new potential, a uh, new purpose. See, all these things combine to produce a new covenant people of character. Now, the, so the record, you know, when you go through, say, Hebrews 11, where it goes through the, the great guys, they're all men, one way or another, ended up being of outstanding character in, in the way that God required, okay? So, uh, you, you, how about Gideon, okay? How, wh where did God start with Gideon, remember? Gideon is inside. He's inside an olive press, right? And he's beating out wheat inside the olive press. Why? Why is he inside? <laughs> so what he's saying, Okay. And remember, the angel says, oh, hey, a valiant warrior. You see, and, and Gideon's response is, hey, you know, my family is the least tribe, least in the tribe, and it's, my tribe's the least in Israel, and I'm the least in my family. What are you talking about? See? But, see, God works with Gideon, doesn't he? Picture, and Gideon has enough faith to carry that out. So at that time, then Gideon had the faith and the character to do what, what God wanted him to do. So character is tied to performance. Now, the, the modern guys that oppose that, see, they, for example, I was listening to a guy speak, um, and uh, he was one that, that openly opposed the concepts of the gospel, glory, and the new creation. And uh, knew him pretty well, actually. You know, uh, Matt and Charlie you know, were in, uh, in Minsk, you know, and we were staying in the same apartment with him and his wife and his son, Matthew. So, uh, I mean, I remember his, he was sitting on the couch there. He was reading Cleansing Inside the Cup. And he said, Jay, the only problem I have <clears throat> with this book is you write in a language that's too, too high level for the barefooted Kentuckians that I work with. See, that, he said that was the only problem he had at the time. See, but later you know, the, the tide turned. So when he was speaking at the Northman, you know, I happened to be there that year in uh, Michigan, and uh, so he's preaching on holiness, okay? And uh, so he's trying to make the point that the Old Testament implements <coughs> were holy, not because they chose to be holy, but because God chose to use them, see? So that bronze knife that's going to be used for for skin and the sacrifices, that's, that's a holy implement to the Lord, and it's not to be used for, for prof, profane use. You know, in, in other words, that bronze knife never be, better not show up in the priest's door at home. Okay, that's, that's holy to the Lord. See, the, the point was the knife didn't have a choice. See, and so he was trying to get to the point that we're holy, too, apart from our choice. But, of course, you got problems with that where the Scripture says, be holy, be, be holy all in all your behavior. You know, be holy. For, okay, so he, he kind of stumbled there. He didn't know how to get past that point. So he changed the subject when he was preaching. And uh, see, the, so that's, the, that's the argument they try to use is that, okay, character is something separate. Yeah, God can use anybody. He used the donkey, you know, in the time of Naaman. But the, the point is, is that he wants to use people by choice. That, that's his earnest desire is to use by choice, and that's why the new covenant is filled with all kinds of exhortations, okay? You know, lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with lust and deceit. Put on the new self, which is being renewed, okay? You know, all these things are character-related, 
and the more our character can imitate Christ, the more effective we can be in interacting with the world around us. Does that cover that one, Nick? Well, so long. So what's <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Help, help. Like I said, I'm still kind of lost as to what is their argument about John, and they c God could have used anybody, but what is their argument against John and that? Like, that's where I'm lost at, I guess. Okay, see there? Okay, because Matthew 11, 11 says that the, basically John was as great or greater than anybody in the Old Covenant. And then the least Christian is greater than me. They have to attack John. Okay, I say God could have used anybody. Okay, so it wasn't that John was so great. It was just that God used him in that spot. And the idea is not that we're so great. You know, our, we don't have to have good character. It's God going to use us. That that help? Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, good. Other comments here? Okay, so everybody knew Samuel was confirmed as a prophet. Next line. So thus the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Okay? So now we got some issues. We've got a, you know, some physical battle issues coming up here. And uh, they can't, the Philistines came and they camped beside Ebenezer while the Philistines camped in Aphek. So we got a, a battle going on. Next, next line. Now Samuel was offering up the bird offering, and the Philistines drew near to the battle to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day against the Philistines and confused them so that they were routed before Israel. Now it just happened when Samuel was offering the sacrifice. Turn to Psalm 99 here for a second. Psalm 99, verse 6. <clears throat> See, Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. See, now notice that see, Samuel is, by special act of God, a priest. See, he's, he's a Levite. See, but the first... The first of anything, you know, okay, uh, who anointed Moses as priest? Nobody, okay? You know, Moses is just a priest, right? Who anointed Aaron? Moses anointed Aaron. But who anointed Moses? See, nobody. See, so Joshua being the first of a line of prophets, is God also set him up as a priest, and so that's why he's offered a sacrifice. And he was, you know, grew up in the house of the Lord. God backed him as a prophet, see. So when he, I mean, he told Samuel, you know, uh, Saul, when Saul became king, he said, now you don't go to battle without me coming and offering the sacrifice, right? And, and Saul violated that. Okay. So, so Moses, Aaron, and Samuel right up there as priests, okay? So God's really backing everything that Samuel's doing. That's why he's offering that burnt offering here. And when he's offering that offering, then right in the middle of that is when the Lord thundered. Next line, next line. So we've got Samuel established as, a, as an authority. See, now we've got to get David established as authority, okay? Saul went bad. Uh, once again, his, his character didn't, didn't stand up. So he's gone. You know, rebellion is as a sin as witchcraft, you know. Uh, twice uh, Saul was guilty of direct disobedience to the Lord, so the Lord says, you're out of here. I'm going to find a man after my own heart who will do all my will. So along comes David, all right? And so uh, David was anointed by Samuel when, he, I'm going to guess, late teens, maybe early 20. You know, I mean, right in there somewhere about 20, when he was anointed. Next slide. So, of course, we all know the story of Goliath, but, see, that's, uh, again, David was a great man of faith. So remember when, when David came down to the camp, okay, Goliath had been coming for 40 days, and every day he'd step out and he'd, he'd roar his challenge, send me a man. And uh, all Israel fled. 
okay? So David came down from, from herding sheep. His dad sent him down with some food for the brothers and, you know, make big cut of cheese for their sector commander. And, uh, and so David says, what are you guys running for? Well, you guys running for this uncircumcised Philistine. See? So David stepped up and took the challenge, didn't he? He said, you come to me in the name of your gods. He said, I come to you by the name of the, the Lord of hosts. He said, furthermore, I'm going to cut your head off. Okay. <laughs> Kill him, cut his head off, right? And, uh, but he did that to, you know, to, among other things, to, to show that the, the God of Israel was backing him. Okay. And, uh, you know, I mean, the Lord was with David. I mean, and, but David knew that. So David's operating by faith, and, and the Lord's backing him. So you can imagine all Israel now, okay, David kills Goliath. So again, that's always an interesting story because you recall when, when Saul was anointed king, he was head and shoulders taller than anybody else in Israel, right? And uh, so when Goliath steps out and says, send me a man, everybody in Israel's turned around and looking at, at Saul. <laughs> Guess who's the biggest and tallest here, guys? But I've always thought, yep, uh, Saul had a lot of paperwork to do that morning, <laughs> just, couldn't, just couldn't get out there, you know. <clears throat> Dave was a great man of faith. Uh, all Israel now is starting to follow David. They're really, next line. David, of course, eventually had to flee from Saul. You remember when they'd come in from battle, you know, David got the, the office of being a commander in the army because of his victory over Goliath. Because, see, the promise was, Okay, if you kill Goliath, you get one of my daughters in marriage, okay? Uh, you get to be a commander in the army, and your family is tax-free. And I don't know how that tax-free ever played out. I've never known a government <laughs> to ever back off, but it's not recorded that David's family got off tax-free. But, tax -free. but <clears throat> he did become a commander, right? And the Lord was with David. And remember when they came marching in, the ladies were singing, Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens thousands. Of course, that torqued Saul. He says, well, what, what else can he want but the kingdom? So eventually, David had to spend those years in the wilderness. And that wasn't easy. You know, I mean, he's, you know, he's scrambling, he's fighting. Eventually, he has to go down and spend time with the Philistines to get away from, from Saul. Next slide. Next line, excuse me. So after uh, Saul was dead... And David became king of Judah at that point, okay, at, at, uh, at Hebron. Okay, he'd already been given the city of Ziklag. And, uh, but there's another seven years. Um, and finally, all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. And King David made a covenant with him before the Lord at Hebron. And they anointed David as king over Israel. See, now all Israel is with David. Okay, uh, next line. So one of the first things that David did after becoming king over all Israel is he captured Jerusalem. Now, let's go to Acts 13 on this. This is uh, Paul preaching to the synagogue in Antioch, okay? And uh, we're starting verse 16, Acts 13, 16. Paul stood up and motioned with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. For a period of about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And when he destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed all their, their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. And after these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Okay, see, the, the promised land was not captured until David took Jerusalem. You know, if you read the record of Joshua, you see that they, they, they ran the Jebusites out of Jerusalem but as soon as Joshua died, the Jebusites went back in. And the Jebusites controlled Jerusalem until David captured the city. It took them that long. You see, it was little by little 
as Moses had said way back in Exodus, okay? So the, the capture of Jerusalem, see, then was a, a significant event. And uh, once again, that, that really established David's credibility, the fact that God was with him and the Lord would speak through him. You know, David often would, he'd inquire the Lord, right? I mean, that's the characteristic of David, okay? Okay, <clears throat> have the priest come with the ephod, okay? Uh, how do I attack? Well, wait till you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees. When you hear the sound of the marching overhead, <laughs> okay, then you attack, all right? Uh, but that's the kind of guy David was, and, and you know, Israel, Israel believed in him, and they backed him. Next. So what, what that did, see, that's going to give David the authority for the Psalms. Okay? So David himself, you know, was, had the character and was pretty clearly a, a prophet of the Lord. Next line. David and the commanders of the army set apart for the service some of the sons of Asaph and of Heman and of Jeduthun, who were to prophesy with lyres, harps, and cymbals. Okay, it's important to get the spelling on that right. Okay, the, uh, but, uh, okay, and you read, there's a lot of psalms that are, say, the sons of Korah or Jeduthun, see, because so those guys were, were minstrels. That is, those were guys who could actually prophesy while they're, they're, you know, delivering their message in song. And David set those up. See, David himself was a prophet, and then these guys are set apart as prophets. So once again, what they write, what they write is regarded as authoritative, okay? And uh, the, uh, let's, let's go to... Uh, Let's go to Acts 2. So Apostle Peter quotes David here, and uh, he quotes Psalm 16. And after that quotation, in verse 29, he says, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on the throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. He was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer, suffer decay. See, David's clearly a prophet, regarded as such. Any of the Psalms are regarded as prophetic, okay? Whether it's the Psalm that Moses wrote or you know, turn to Psalm 89. Psalm 89 tells you, it says it's a masculine of Ethan the Ezraite. Okay? Now, a lot of your versions will have some stuff in italics before that. But then this is going to be in vertical standard type. That is in part of the inspired text. Yeah, just as much. It's going to say one, I will sing of the loving kindness. Okay, a masculine of Ezra, or of Ethan the Ezraite, is just as inspiring as the next words. Okay? That's part of the inspired text. And, uh, you know, he's mentioned, you know, about this. He's contemporary with, with these guys that David's being set aside as uh, as minstrels, okay. and of course this is you know this is a, a tremendous psalm. I mean, there's you know there's stuff in here that's uh, that's really great. But I would like you to look at uh, say verse. Uh, oh, I'll start in verse twenty. Psalm eighty nine twenty. He said, "I found David my servant." Okay. Now, you're going to see this is going to be a prophetic David as we work through this, okay? With holy, my holy oil, I have anointed him, with whom my hand will be established. My arm will also strengthen him. The enemy will not deceive him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I shall crush his adversaries before him and strike those who hate him. My faithfulness and my loving kindness will be with him, 
and in my name his horn will be exalted. I will set his, also set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He will cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I shall also shall make him my firstborn, see, the highest of the kings of the earth. My loving kindness I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. So I will establish his descendants forever and his throne as the days of heaven. That's not David. Okay, that's a prophetic David, see, and that's, that's there's a lot of stuff in, in Psalms like that. Now, again, God's going a lot of work to establish the authority of these things that are written in, in the, the Psalms or, or, you know, Proverbs or Job or whatever. These things are being established in Israel as authoritative. Any thoughts or comments here? See, so it's interesting. You can see why God had to have the nation Israel. See, he has to, <clears throat> okay, he's looking at the pagan peoples around <clears throat> in the days of Abraham. What's he got? He's got nothing to work with. Nothing. See, he finds, finds Abraham, right? Abraham, in the midst of that paganism, he's, he's not going to go with that plan. See, so God works with Abraham. Through Abraham, you know, we get Isaac. Through Isaac, we get Jacob. Through Jacob, we get the sons of Israel, right? And again, God works with the sons of Israel, has them go to Egypt where he preserves them as a separate nation. See, he's working. See, and, and the primary re means that he's working with them is to establish the authority of his word. And he's got other things he's going on. He's using law and typology and everything else. But the primary reason he's working with these guys is to establish the authority of a scripture. And that's, that's the purpose of physical Israel, uh, eventually, is to make sure that the Christ comes into the world, to make sure that the scripture is there written and backed as authoritative. So, 